what I've come to believe in a sense is the opposite of the suggestion that's that's in your question, that maybe nothing, nothing is the only possibility. And because of that, it's the appearance of something that is inevitable. Is nothing an impossibility? And if so, is something inevitable? David, we'll start with you, then go to Amanda and Lee. Okay, well, um, I think it's important not to lapse into essentialism here, um, trying to extract the essence of things like, uh, you know, Plato and that, that kind of person. Um, because that leads to thinking that this, this is a non-issue that um, anyone who tries to ask what nothing is is just talking nonsense. And, but it does come up in terms of real problems. So, for example, 13.8 billion years ago, time began at the Big Bang. And is that a paradox? Well, it, if something began, then it can't have existed at an earlier time. And if time began, uh, there, there were no earlier times. Whatever brought about the transition from time not existing to existing must have happened before time existed, which seems like a contradiction. But it could make sense. For example, it could be that there was no moment of the Big Bang, just moments after it, just like there's no smallest positive fraction. And thus there would be no moment before which the universe um, did not yet exist. So that, that would make sense. Uh, is it true? I don't know. But, but here's, here's a case where we're really talking about nothing. Suppose, suppose you're standing at the North Pole and you ask, uh, what is north of here? You, you've been trudging all the way there. You can get more and more north. Is it, is it possible to get more north than the North Pole? Is there a barrier there preventing you from, from uh, going further? Or is it just that all directions are south and, and we'll just call one of them north arbitrarily? Um, that is um, a question of terminology. But a very similar question about the universe is not a matter of technology. Uh, of, of, of terminology. Um, that is, suppose that the universe were, were a torus, so that if you went um, far enough in that direction, you'd come back from that direction. Um, um, then, um, is that the same as there being an infinite number of universes, all identical, and the, the, you, you go from one to the other? Is, is identifying two sides which you can go through, the same thing as having an infinite number. Well, there, I don't think it's just a matter of terminology. I think there's a real question there, and it shows you that there has to be a broader theory of what the universe is and what space is that would tell you whether the real thing is just an infinitely repeated finite segment of space or whether it is um, uh, just one of them identified. So I would say don't get sucked into the nihilist position that the problem is not a problem. Usually a problem is a problem. And uh, unless people are mischievously citing just words, which some philosophers do, um, then uh, the problem has to be addressed. Let's uh, let's hope we can at least uh, define our terms better, if not solve the problem today. Um, uh, thank you, David. Um, so, Amanda, would you like to address the pitch? Uh, is nothing an impossibility? Uh, and if so, is something inevitable? Um, this question of what is nothing um, is extremely close to my heart. It's it's actually the singular question that has driven my entire career. It's what got me interested in physics in the first place. It's how I ended up as a journalist. Um, and I mean, it's truly shaped my my life. I've spent the last 30 years 
thinking about nothing. And, um, and that's because when I was 15 years old, my, my father, who is this sort of Zen guru, former hippie turned radiologist, took me out to dinner at our favorite Chinese restaurant and asked me, how would you define nothing? Um, and this question was like this spark that set off this crazy journey that led us, you know, deep into, into cutting edge physics. It led us to crash a physics conference in 2002 that was being held in honor of the great physicist, John Wheeler. Um, you know, Wheeler was, that was where I met Lee Sloan for the first time. Um, and Wheeler was this brilliant physicist who had these very radical ideas about the nature of reality. And my dad and I showed up posing as journalists. And I said I was from Manhattan Magazine, which, you know, didn't exist. And um, and and we met Wheeler at this this meeting and we asked him several questions. But one of them was, is everything from nothing? Um, and Wheeler nodded and said, I like to say the boundary of a boundary is zero. So it was like Yoda answering a physics question and we had no idea what it meant. And um, so for the next few decades, well, for one thing, my fake journalism career sort of morphed into a real journalism career. And, but more importantly, I kept chasing this question about nothing. And what I've come to believe you know, after after reading through all of Wheeler's personal journals, trying to get it, like what did what was he really trying to say? What did he think about nothing? After speaking to so many amazing physicists and like immersing myself in today's cutting edge physics and cosmology, what I've come to believe, in a sense, is the opposite of the suggestion that's that's in your question. Um, that maybe nothing nothing is the only possibility. And and because of that, it's the appearance of something that is inevitable. For now, we should move on to uh, the Lee. Lee. I've built several theories of physics, to none complete, but some that get us some insight into what the world might be. And none of them had a concept of nothing or required a concept of nothing. Um, I think that you're wrong-headed to start at the beginning with that question because I think the question we should start with is time. And if you get the meaning of time, the construction of the world in time correctly, and I'll say what I mean by that in a minute, you don't have to ever encounter the idea of nothing in a physics concept. I'm not going to talk about my Zen Buddhist friends and so forth, who, who are justly on their own path. So I believe that all that exists, first of all, nothing exists, things only happen. And things that happen, happen according to some rules which are developed in time and change in time, so there's nothing that we call a time which is real, which is really what a plainness would call time. That is, I don't believe there's anything that is stationary and unchanging. I think everything changes. And our job as physicists is to find out what are the rules under which things might change. And if you go about that, seems to me correctly, you don't have to encounter the idea of nothing. So that's where I would start. I don't want to go on and on with that, but that's where I would start with the notion of time. And if you like, with time being the distinction between something unchanging and something changing. And when we have something which changes, we want it to change according to some rules or some, some happenings. And then we're talking about changes of changes. And that's what I think is interesting. And I think Johnny Wheeler th thought that way. And um, he, he was very confusing, certainly. But I think that what he was searching for was an understanding of how change could change. Thank you. 
wonderful. I, I really hope we can um, pick apart some of the uh, potential conflicts here. Um, but for now, we're going to move into what we're calling theme one, where we build our definitions and make sure we're speaking in the same language. And so theme one is, what is nothing? Um, which we can expand on our, our earlier statements. And I, I again want to start with David. David, uh, I invite you to expand and to even address the pictures of your fellow speakers, if you so wish. Yeah, um, I too don't think that what is questions um, are a good place to start because um, you only find out what, what something is when you have a theory of it. You know, what, what is a dog? Well, the only people that can really answer that question are zoologists or, or veterinarians who, who deal with dogs, and they can they can they can answer such questions. Um, so, what I, uh, coming to what Lee was saying, okay, I don't mind um, things just happening and not not primarily existing. So things happen. If they happen, they happen according to rules. I'm with you that far. The rules can change, I'm with you that far, but I would draw the line at, uh, well, the, the question is, do the rules which change, change according to a rule, and if that can cannot change, so that then that's the only thing that can't change, this rule that can't change, or if everything can change, then it's not true that everything that changes, changes according to a rule. Right. And that's a that's a paradox. I, I wrote a book with Roberto Mangueira Unger, who is a rather a very deep philosopher. He thinks about many things, and I certainly admire him. And he that's a paradox, according to him. We walk into an it's a paradox, and he would argue that bringing oneself into a deep paradox is progress, and, that, and that's that's what you've accomplished. And out. <laughs> We want to be able to come out of a deep paradox as well. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. With a free trial, you can enjoy the full talk and thousands more. Thank you for being part of the conversation.